Hello everyone and welcome back to Southern Deadly Yarns. I'm Eve from Onkapringa Libraries and I'm joined as always by Elijah from Neferendi Aboriginal Forum. Um, we're halfway through our series today with a very special guest, Tyson Yunker Porter, the author of The Brilliant Sand Talk, which we all loved. Um, it's a totally original and intriguing work examining complexity, failed civilizations and the dreaming or turnaround um, that can guide us in, can guide the world in sustainability. Oh, it's been too long. I uh, missed these Southern Deadly Yarns. But um, yeah, I just wanted to pay homage as well to the traditional lands of the Ghana people that were on today and recognise their continuing spirit and connection to this country. Um, that's that saying, Ghana, Nina Mani, are you good? Oh, Atawampa, you know, Bana saying hello out there. Um, oh. <laughs> And, and, and of course, hello to everybody joining us online today. So, welcome Tyson. I think we're going to just jump straight into it with a book question because I am a librarian after all. <laughs> um, your book is filled with really important and significant content, but you delivered it in a really colloquial fashion. You used a lot of oh, humour yeah. in there, a lot of drawings and things. Um, everybody I forced this book on, which is a lot of people. <laughs> My boss, I think I forced it on you, everybody. <laughs> Um, is really surprised by how funny it is. So I just wondered, was that an intentional choice? Did you think that was a really good way to deliver the content or, yeah? Uh, I, look, I, I just think it just comes out of my marginality, you know, um, as a person. Um, and I guess in starting to talk about who I am, I should acknowledge that I'm sitting on Bunurong country right now, um, near Melbourne there. And, uh, yeah, acknowledge that I'm 3,000. I mean, I might be trying to be Southern Deadly down here, but um, Northern Deadly is a very different thing. <laughs> <laughs> Although I got connections both ways, you know, like ancestrally from the South, but then, um, you know, adoptive ties in the North and, and, you know, cultural ties all over. It's, you know, there's Deadly everywhere. And I believe that the word Deadly came from the Irish. I got a theory about that because I was listening to a podcast of someone in Ireland and they said, yeah, to be sure that's deadly. And, and I was like, Oh, that's why, you know, so many black names are Irish names. <laughs> that's where it comes from. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, yeah, we... shout out, shout out to the Irish there. Our, uh, <laughs> you know, the blacks of Europe. Uh, yeah. <laughs> How you <he's> going? <laughs> um, yeah. So funny. I look, I just, uh, I, I, uh, and the informal and all the rest, I, I don't know really any other way to be. Um, and look, I mean, all the other authors, ah, get out of this. <laughs> she's worse. She's the same way. She's got that bad gene from me. You're a bad seed, Oni. <laughs> my daughter. Um, mm. All right. All right. We can get a dentist to look at that later. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but... Um, I don't know, like the other authors you have on here, they're all like, you know, people who, you know, they've had a big and respected body of work. Like, you know, back when I was still eating roadkill, you know? Um, so, you know, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm just a fella. I'm not like, uh, you know, I'm not a big name in the academic world or, and this is really the first book I've had published or that's been attributed to me anyway. Usually people just steal them. But, you know, um, yeah, I don't know. It's, and it's just a book. It's not a really big deal. <laughs> so, I don't know, maybe I, that's the way I approach it. I, like, I don't really have any skin in the game yet. And I'm not really, you know, I don't really have a body of work to protect or a, a tenured position to try and hold on to or a, a market share of any kind that, you know, I need to build a brand around. So I just kind of uh, be myself and I'm as silly as her. I tell you, I'm going to get her out of here. She's going to wreck this thing. Oni. No, that, that, that's her, right? Uh, uh, pen, da, pen. Oh. We love to see pets, kids, anything in the arms, don't we? Why, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we did see somebody's dinner. Yeah. Yeah. I tell you what. Uh, they're going to kill me, those bubs. You know, are we on lockdown here? Oh, no. They're back in again. Oh, wow. Hang on a sec. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
this boy now. <laughs> you can do it. Come on. Sorry, man. Don't be sorry. It's adding to the entertainment yeah. value. <laughs> you know, and I guess in the end, you've got to laugh. Oh, my son, I'm going to... Oh. It's real what life, this, Tyson. Down. Oh, my God. Did, did you want to introduce him to everybody? <laughs> Yeah, he's making himself known. No, he's wild. He's like a proper little. Oh. See, his mum's a Murray, and 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 so he's got that um that no good Murray <laughs> wildness in him. Yeah. Uh, anyway, where was I? The untamed mind. Oh, yeah. The um the funny thing. It's just I, I guess I just haven't learned. Look, I'll, I'll, I'll figure it out. I'll flog it out of myself eventually. I've just got to learn my disciplines a bit better. And, you know, I mean, people are calling me complexity theorists and that, but I'm a real novice at pretty much everything, you know, at writing, at, you know, culture, even everything. I'm like uh, 101 here. But I'm, you know, I, I like to look at a lot of different disciplines. You could call me a polymath except I haven't actually mastered any particular discipline yet. So I just like... I find that there's interesting stuff that come out of combina combinatorials, you know, so I follow that, um, that way of, that we have in our culture of being able to bring together multiple narratives and have them sit comfortably together, even when they're contradictory. Penta. Yeah. And, and you do, and you do talk about, um, I've been a bit reflective of your book lately as well. And this idea of that post apocalyptic kind of, kind of traumas that you pick up and I dare say, you know, the Irish would have picked that up, you know, the yeah. English to a certain extent from the Romans, the Vikings and that kind of stuff. Mm. Um, the, I've, I've studied population ecology and we, we don't tend to be on a good trend at the moment with this sort of exponential growth. Yeah. Um, and you do talk about your book, you know, what can we do about, you know, trying to set things in motion. So, you know, if the car goes off the cliff, then we're not all, you know, going to be deeply traumatised by it, that we can actually keep society and cultures sustaining. Well, look, so your old people had that, um, had that song line with all those water, water holes and underground water there where the telegraph line went, went along that yeah. one. Yeah, the old Edna Data track. Yeah. yeah. Now, there was a, um, a little bit of a... <laughs> A little bit of an apocalypse back in the mid 1800s, where there was a massive uh, solar flare. And have you? Is, does that part come into the story? No. So all around, all around the world, there was that big EMP blast from the sun, and it basically just blew up the whole telegraph system. No. You, know, you had all these; they were just exploding into fire. Oh, all right. It happened all over the place, and it's actually it happens periodically. Like, um, you know, like every I don't know, 150 years or something like that, 180 years, and it's kind of like we're overdue for the next one. And it's, it's going to be a lot more than some telegraph poles this time, you know. So um, I think we periodically have these, these apocalypses. That was an apocalypse at the time because they come to rely on that for communication. And it took them a while to set it back up again and get it going. But, uh, you know, and uh, I guess that's the message of the book is that, Apocalypses aren't an end to things. They're just, uh, it's a period of, um, you know, upheaval. Um, you know, uh, what they call hysteresis, you know, in complexity theory. And then usually returns to some kind of homeostasis or stability again, you know, when the pattern reasserts itself, but then that pattern's mutated a bit. So no. apocaly apocalypses are a necessary part of creation, keeps things fresh, you know. You keep replicating that same system over and over, you end up with uh, stagnation and entropy and, um, you know, and it falls apart anyway. So you've got to shake things up every now and then. I personally am looking forward to the next uh, solar EMP. <laughs> It'll be proper deadly. South and north and everything in between. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I can go back to my abacus and homing pigeons then or something. Hey. hey. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I wonder what uh, magnetic effects that has even on homing pigeons. 
<laughs> just fly around in circles and come back. Yeah, they, they, they're following some, you know, different lines of force there. I wonder if that uh, throws that out a bit. Yeah. Imagine that. We're going to have all these magpie geese just like <laughs> running into walls and stuff. <laughs> Flying yeah. into my oven. Yeah. Hey, hey, straight in the ground oven. Boom. Nice. And, and do you think that'll get us back to Yarny? This idea of texting and, you know, and emailing. To actually sit down and have a proper kind of conversation. Yeah. Well, you know, every single mobile phone blows up in our hand or our pocket. And I mean, once you treat the burns. And then we can sit around that ground oven with the free magpie geese dropping into it out of the sky and <laughs> sit around and have a bit of a yarn, I guess. Um, yeah, but proper yarning too. You know, this kind of back and forth and, um, you know, the, building the, that relation and the protocol, you know, um, you know, gradually bringing those narratives together alongside and, and just having them interact and dance in there together and see what falls out, you know, um, that kind of yarn. You know, proper yarns, not this, uh, you know, quest q and A. I I hate Q&A. And I hate these monologues too. You know, I, I recall somebody mentioned to me recently about the AGMs that they've uh, been attending recently and <laughs> the tendency of, um, you know, um, a few legacy narcissists uh, to kind of dominate proceedings with um, nothing much at all. Yeah, yeah. And Someone said amazing. that. I can't remember who said that. It's amazing when you see it come to life, you know, and there's this thing and it's squawking up and down the walkways and going off their heads. And, mm. You know, mm. where's, where's that social contract, you know, that mm. reciprocal nature? Sit down, mm. be respectful, listen to everybody. It all just goes out the window. But mm. I, I, I love the book in that. It, oh, it, was it Juma from the Nunga country? In, Not Nunga. Uh, no, that was... Um, yeah, different ones from Nyunga, Buja over there, and that Wajak Nyunga, and then there's um, but Juma is from Blaraki up uh, Northern Territory, uh, oh. south of Darwin there. That mob. Because I I love that story, and I, I always tell people about it because everybody seems to have these narcissistic emus running foul all over the place. It's yeah, yeah. Like, oh, how do we oh, the emu story. Yeah, that's another one. Um, oh. So Juma was the you know echidna and turtle. Um, and the echidna was no good one there in that story. But then um, in the Nyunga way, you know, echidna is one of the ones, you know, uh, that, that even uh, <laughs> as crazy as he is, he's one of the ones that's trying to hold that emu, <laughs> that crazy emu in check. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The snake on the legs and, you know. Yeah, yeah. Holding him down. Well, containing the excesses of malignant narcissists is a team effort. Yeah. yeah. You know, the snake, the kangaroo. <laughs> Porcupine, everybody got to be there holding that one down. He's um, he's gonna run around and kick up the dust. I think there's a lot of dust kicking at the moment uh, in cyberspace and in the Twitter sphere and everywhere else. You know, I think a lot of people, um, you know, because there's this branding thing that goes on, and it's not our fault. You know, we're all forced in order to survive in this economy to become little corporations unto ourselves. So we have to make sure we have good branding. And that we're speculating on our futures, you know, uh, by by growing that brand. And, um, you know, there's no real capital left in the world because there's baby boomers sitting on top of it all on those mountains. So all we've got left is cultural capital and social capital that we can leverage against white guilt credits or something. And we're kind of <laughs> just, you know. Uh, no, that's so true. You know, we're, we're, we're just going on these, you know, identity futures. Uh, that it will, and we're playing that little stock market and we kind of have to just to survive. There's a few crumbs will drop off the table for that one. Um, you know, so I don't know, because of that economy and I'm aware of that economy and that people need it to survive. You know, I don't really judge people too harshly who are kicking up dust around the place because you know that there's sort of parts of their brand around the idea of authenticity that, um, may not look too good if if the air is clear you know what i mean um you know and we've all got that you know anybody who's just saying they're a proud one thing it's like well nah it's there's been a bit of a history recently whereby that's been a bit uh disrupted and mixed up and 
you know, we're all from a bunch of different places, um, you know, and, and, you know, having to try and manage those identities and, um, but, you know, having to leverage them into something, you know, simplistic, that's going to fit the, um, you know, the authenticity requirements of, of, you know, a, a few settlers who haven't really got a clue <laughs> about history or, you know, the realities of culture or anything else. It's, it's quite difficult. So I don't judge anybody on that one. Um, you got to do what you got to do to survive. And I think there is that new narrative starting to permeate where people are actually starting to think, well, hey, no, there were, there's well and truly sophistication here. There's not just this sort of hapless native running around the country and hunting and gathering. There's yeah. actually real systems in place. Yeah. Well, that's just it, though. Um, not, you know, it's the hardest thing. I mean, what the hell does a fish know about water? He doesn't even know water exists because it's just his medium, you know, and it's the same, the same way. Any of us who are genuinely authentically living a complete life within those knowledge systems that are so important, we can't see them. You know, it takes like a, a mongrel outcast like me to be able to, you know, have one foot in and one foot out and bloody even be able to see that it exists. And, but most of us aren't really looking at the systems or at the processes, you know, of culture and, you know, uh, and the intellectual traditions and, the, you know, the methods of inquiry and, and all those sorts of things. We're not looking at that. We're looking at the content rather than the process. We're looking at the objects rather than the system and the identities rather than the governance structures, you know? So we're looking at those bright, shiny parts, those bright, shiny stars rather than the, the meaningful spaces in between the stars where all the knowledge really sits, you know? Mm. So, um, and, you know, I guess there's reasons for that. And so we're all kind of, um, you know, rebrand, rebranding, sanitizing and sort of producing those things and reproducing those things as, as these products that we have to, um, we have to provide in order to be allowed to con continue to survive. You know, and so it's a it's a tricky, it's a really tricky economy to have to be in relation to. You know, um, I I got a good warning yesterday uh, from there's this really amazing thinker in the United States, and he he gave me a warning and said, look, you're going to have to um, think about this, the things that you're sharing with the world, uh, the the indigenous processes, and um, uh, especially ideas about conscious things that would reveal things about human consciousness. Um, because there's a whole heap of autistic sociopaths trying to develop artificial general intelligence right now, which represents a, um, an existential risk to the survival of all life on the planet. And if they get hold <laughs> of your understandings about consciousness, um, they will use it and, and they will destroy everything with artificial intelligence. And I'm like, oh, and you say right now they can't see it because they're like autistic sociopaths. They, they their understanding of consciousness is very two dimensional. So like, don't tell them too much. <laughs> and this was coming on the heels of um, this fellow, Ben Goetzel. Ben Goetzel, probably most people haven't heard about him, but he's the guy who's, he's closer than anyone else on the planet to developing artificial general intelligence. And I saw something he wrote the other day where he'd read my book and it was the first time he'd come across the concept of uh, contextual reasoning. And he went, mm, indigenous contextual reasoning. Uh, I'm going to factor that into my equations, my algorithms. Ah, um, a black fellow robot coming off the lines. Well, uh, <laughs> I don't know. It's just... Um, it's just on one level, I go, oh, my God, like that guy is, has read my book. Um, that's weird. That's a weird thing to think about because, you know, he's someone I've been aware of for a few years in that field of AI and, you know, that, that whole digital world or blockchain and everything else. And then, um, you know, because he's at the cutting edge of things. And so I've been watching his work for a while and trying to assess the, 
the risk level of um, artificial general intelligence because his, his company is called singularity.net. So he's got, he's, he, that's his aim is the singularity. You remember Terminator, you know, Skynet and all that sort of stuff? Yeah, well, I always thought the galaxy started off in a singularity. And then it's ex- it's well, there's that, this. yeah. But they're looking at a singularity of artificial consciousness. Ah. So that moment is, you know, a lot of people see that as, well, that will be the real apocalypse, like the end of everything. So like a hive of super consciousness. Yeah, like the end of carbon-based life. That'll just be it, finished. But um, yeah, so I'm, I'm sitting there wondering, I don't know, I had that, that feeling like, um, like Einstein might have had about the Manhattan Project, you know? I, like I just, not that I'm, I think I'm anything near Einstein, but I just thought, man, what if I just accidentally kicked off Skynet and like, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger is going to be running around trying to kill my, my kids. <laughs> you, were, um, were you surprised that people like that were reading your book, Tyson? Did you ever think you were going to have that kind of a reach with Santor? No, no, not at all. You know, and this was something that came later, you know, uh, with the U S launch. Um, see, after I wrote the book, I started actually looking a bit deeper into complexity theory. And this led me into these communities that I never knew existed, um, you know, out of Silicon Valley and um, the Santa Fe Institute, um, and, like, and um, you know, all these weird communities coming together, like really different, but they're looking at putting together the new decentralized economies and governance structures to replace uh, this failing civilization now, all in an attempt to try and make civilization live longer or to be sustainable. And they're all like transhumanists, you know, this idea that we need to um, rise above our primitive origins, which is, you know, our primitive fight or flight responses because we're still basically cavemen running around with phones is what's destroyed this civilization. And we've got to rise above that and become these uh, perfect cyborgs that are going to live forever, all that kind of thing. So there's all these communities around that. And I thought, oh, I'm going to have to talk, like I started to see that there's a, that's a strange attractor bringing all them together. So it's kind of like those communities and the big conversations they're having and they're all around. You, you ever heard of that intellectual dark web? Yeah. They're all like, uh, you know, incestuously interrelated, all these people. And so I've been talking to all of them, started doing their shows and stuff, going on their podcasts, trying to figure out what's going on. But I really believe that they're the fulcrum, um, on which the, the, the world is about to be shifted. Um, all those, those weird communities that they have an insane amount of power and, um, you know, people kind of dismiss them a bit because they're just cancelable. It's like, well, you didn't, um, <laughs> I don't know. You didn't agree with something, you know, anti-misogynistic. I just said or something. So you're cancelled kind of thing. And, and uh, they're all people who've been cancelled. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but they're all people who've been cancelled and, and weirdly it's made them more powerful. Like, I, I, But they all whinge about it, like, oh, I got cancelled, I got cancelled, but it was the best thing that ever happened to them because nobody knew them before that. Then they get cancelled and suddenly they've sold three million books and they're like, uh, everybody's listening to them. <laughs> so I wish they'd stop whinging about it. Damn it. Yeah. Oh. And like uh, they talk about themselves like they're, they're kind of driven underground and they're these rebels and all this sort of stuff, but... Um, you know, really they're doing quite well, um, you know, and they, and they talk about this kind of fear of being canceled um, and this fear of the social justice warriors and the, and the extreme left and the, you know, et cetera. But, um, you know, uh, and kind of, I don't know, it's kind of like signaling to a base of people, you know, um, who, who have a fear of, of all that and of the future. And there's a lot of them. And so they're kind of, they're actually rallying like pretty much half the population of the Anglosphere behind themselves. Um, and they're quite powerful. And I don't think anybody's noticed that they're not marginal because their brand, self-branding is marginal, but they're quite powerful. Uh, so anyway, I've been looking into that. And uh, since I've been doing that, it's, it's um, the book has kind of exploded in the US um, a fair bit because they seem to find a lot of things in there that they like. Um, 
which bothers me a little bit because it makes me think, well, how much of, <laughs> you know, um, how dark am I going here? Yeah. And how, how, how far down that rabbit hole do I want to go? Like just to try and it, see, here's the thing. They're all based and I'm going to stop in a minute because this is a monologue. Um, but all their theories are based on, and we can come into this better later, but they're based on this uh, uh, evolutionary theory that has um, bad data, flawed data at the baseline, bad baseline data about a paleolithic past. You know, so human beings are just, you know, motivated by pleasure and pain. Uh, we have fight or flight responses, you know, because cavemen were just walking around ooga booger in the wilderness, terrified the whole time, never knowing when a tiger was going to jump out and eat them. And I want to get into that community and keep throwing up the objection that, no, no, bros, we always know where the tigers are. <laughs> you know, in an actual connected lifestyle on a land base as indigenous people, you know where the predators are and you have a relationship with them. You know, nobody ever gets eaten. Fight or flight is not the patterning of human behavior. But we can get a bit into that later if you want to go proper deep dive into game theory and how that's pretty much shaped the entire system that we're living under right now. I think that so. Bad research. Because one of the things that have stayed with me since sort of high school and, you know, you, you do a bit of work with Shakespeare and you know, what a grasp he had and he talks in Hamlet about, you know, this being of noble reason and infinite faculties. What a piece of work. And, yeah, yeah. His man. Not woman, by the way. Sorry. Sorry, sis. Not you. It's just what a piece of work is man. Yeah, he is a rubbish. Just us fellas here, according yeah. to Shakespeare. But that's 500 years ago. And in his culture, that women were chattel, you know, like a dog or a horse or something. So, you know, cultural relativism. Yeah, anyway. We don't want to have to cancel you. <laughs> we could go back 500 and cancel William. <laughs> yeah all the williams because it looks like it was actually about 12 people anyway keep going bros what are you saying later well that idea that beings of infinite faculty existed 500 years ago and you know we've got great sort of renaissance artists that come to mind and you know once every now and then we'll sort of see a percolation of it but i think you know that cornerstone of oh, the, these hapless natives just running around somehow surviving is, you know, absurd. But that that has become the main narrative. And do, do you think that that is holding back society in general, our, our you know, our homeostatic ways? How, how do we actually break that and surpass it and become those, you know, those, those beings of infinite faculty? Yeah. Well, here's the thing. I, I strongly believe strongly the believe that if if we as the 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 remnant uh, indigenous cultures on the planet if we fail to bring every single human being back under the law of the land then everything and everyone is going to die you know and and it's that act of of being able to recognize and come back under the law of the land you know, and the law is in the land all the time and it communicates with you all the time. So that process of coming back into that and seeing that communication and following it and becoming part of it, that inductive process, that's, um, that's how you can regain your cognition and uh, sort of, you know, break out of the feedlots that we're stuck in right now as domesticated humans. We need to reclaim our place as the custodial species of the planet because that's where the genius is. But it's not in any one of us. So you look deep inside yourself and you'll find that there is no deep inside. There's pretty much nothing in there. You know, your mind is not inside your body. You know, it's part of it, but your mind goes out into your relations, in your relationships. It sits in the spaces in between the people that you yarn with, but also the non-humans that you yarn with. And above all, your big yarn, your big communication, 
with your big mother, which is the land that bore you, you know, the, your landscape, wherever you might find yourself, your communication with that, your knowledge sits in your communication between that. So, you know, even your brain scientists, they know that all most human cognition and certainly most human memory is based on a navigational uh, kind of uh, aspect of your brain mechanics. You know, so it's about, it's most of our awareness and memory is spatial. And it's also narrative based. It's tied together by a big story that we're always creating, you know? So place and story, you come back under that. I mean, but you've already got that. If you can walk and talk and think and remember, you're already doing it. So you just need to find those fragments in yourself and start rebuilding a proper strong relation, um, you know, with your land base and with all the non-human entities around you and the human people you're in relation to. Because that's where your knowledge is and that's where the story is and you build it from that. Mm. And Jane in the chat's just asked Tyson, is that an encouragement for everybody to make a connection with their land regardless of their heritage or their culture? Absolutely. But that doesn't mean run out and buy a dream catcher and a freaking feather fan and hang it on your wall and say Tyson sent me, you know, <laughs> it's not that. And, and I tell you, I'm sick of people who are um, kind of all, with an almost sort of willful ignorance, taking that message away from it. This is an in, isn't an invitation to continue plundering indigenous cultures, you know, for the material aspects of that culture. This is about rediscovering your own. You know, this is about looking deep, you know, into your relations within your actual foundational culture and within yourself and finding, you know, finding that fellow that will chasing aurochs across the plains of Europe or whatever, you know, finding that relation. I was just, I've just got off talking to a Bosnian woman who was, <laughs> well, she, you know, well, her, her parents were Bosnian and I'm like going, you know, and we were talking about that uh, fight or flight thing and the predators and our relationship with them. And I'm like, well, look, your great grandmother would have been in the mountains there around Bosnia or whatever. And she'd have been following the bears through the forest in different seasons to see what kind of funguses she could eat. And she'd have been in communion with that bear and having the same diet as that bear. So, you know, don't go like lumping yourself under this, uh, this idea of Western or European or something like that. You know, um, you know, we tend to brand you, uh, Western culture and European culture as evil or something like that. You know, but, um, you know, these are the same of, as us, people who've only recently been removed uh, from the landscape, you know, by a different system and a different handful of oligarch families who are basically ruining uh, all life on this planet. You know, a hundred years ago, most of the people on the planet were still living on the land. Yeah, that's, that's right. hundred years ago. And a hundred years ago, the concept of nation did not exist. The idea of a nation as a form of social organization was just something to facilitate monopolies and a big transfer of wealth and resources to 80 families. That's all it was, the idea of nation. So I find, you know, if you want to survive as a people in this world, you now have to call yourself a nation and take on all the trappings of nationhood in order to survive. If you see anyone who's not doing that, they'll pretty soon be gone and dead. You know? we, we do tend to be under that um, at the moment. A lot of people are nation rebuilding the First Nations. Yeah. And yeah. You'll see that time and time again. And I often tend to think, oh, it's good to have these good governance structures and how to go about things. But, mm. but it doesn't really encompass that sustainability model. Yeah. Well, look, here's the thing. Um, you know, those are centralized governance structures, those nations, and they're based on hierarchies. And a lot of our mobs have taken them on because we've had to, you know, because nobody will give us money or even allow us to live if we don't take it on. So I don't blame anyone for doing that. But our way is not like that. Our way is more like what all these, um, uh, the weirdos I was talking about before, who are actually kind of geniuses, <laughs> they're all walk working towards trying to put together 
decentralized governance systems. And a lot of them are looking into the past, but they're not really looking at a proper picture of the past to find it. Now, one of the big things in there is this idea of the commons, uh, that every community has common resources and common wealth that everybody cares for collectively and, uh, and draws upon collectively as needed. Now, one of the problems arising from that uh, in these industrial times is what they're calling a multipolar trap. Now, a multipolar trap is basically, you know, when you've got multipolar, so lots of different people all collectively looking after something, the multipolar trap is that all you need is one asshole to wreck it. That's my translation of a multipolar trap. They're a lot more complicated how they say it, but I look at it and I just see one ass. One asshole comes in and starts overgrazing that commons or um, taking more than he should or polluting there or doing the wrong thing. Uh, that gives him an unfair advantage. So all of a sudden, everybody has to start doing that or he'll outcompete them. So that's the multipolar trap and the tragedy of the commons is that everything gets you know, destroyed that way. And a race to the bottom. Our proper patterns of indigenous governance and kinship demonstrate the way multipolarity can be sustainable over thousands and thousands of years. Our governance is multipolar. You know, our governance is uh, interdependent and power is distributed throughout the community and throughout the system of humans and non-humans. And we mastered that, you know, and, uh, and there's still, we still have memory of that. You know, we still have those patterns and these are things that we can share. So it's not just here, here's a didgeridoo I made and I'll show you how to play it. That's one thing and that's great. And I'm glad some people are doing that and that's lovely, but um, there's more than that. There's like, here's this governance model that can solve your issue of multipolar traps in creating a decentralized governance and economic system. Anyway, and I only do that stuff because I need to stay in my lane. Like I don't want to steal anybody else's market share. So I, I only look at the stuff that nobody else wants and nobody wants that stuff because it's complicated. And it's like, that's cop. That's just, ah, oh, that's yeah. Nah, that's, that's a proper black follow that you can look at that complicated stuff. So I just, I, I just look at the stuff that's um, kind of really marginal that nobody else wants. So in a way I'm still eating roadkill. Um, nothing much has changed in the last couple of decades. Um, wow. I'm just eating intellectual roadkill now. And uh, it's the stuff that no one wants. It's boring, isn't it? Well, I don't know about this lane stuff. <laughs> we were talking about lanes yesterday. I don't even and, have a lane. I'm on the side of the highway. <laughs> Everyone else has got a lane. I'm walking along the side, eating the roadkill. And I'm happy with that. At least there's some fucking grass there, bros. We were talking about, you know, as a non-Indigenous person, which I am, how, how do I stay in my lane? But also, you know, I want to help and I want to be a good ally, but I don't want to overstep my bounds and put myself into spaces where I'm not welcome. Mm. Which, you know, and... Rightly so, I shouldn't be welcome everywhere. But yeah, we had an interesting conversation about lanes. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, you don't have a lane. You've got like this Mobius strip that's impossible to drive on. Um, you know, because it's like silence is not an option. Um, <laughs> silence is not an option, but shut up and listen. Yeah, so you've got to strike the balance, right? Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, and a lot of things, you know, you, you, you need to stop being racist, but you can't because you're biologically racist and irretrievably, in it, irredeemably a sinner. And, um, and so therefore, <laughs> I don't know. It sounds very uh, religious to me. It sounds very much, um, I don't know. I think the Catholics did it best. Um, <laughs> but there's a few people who are having a stab at competition with the Catholic Church on that one, uh, which is pretty cool, I think. You know, and more power to them. You know, there's people who've got no chance at any kind of capital and no chance at changing their actual condition. And this system right now, this economic and political system that's protecting baby boomers and like geriatric pricks who are running everything to the point that are only two choices for the leaders of the free world right now are septuagenarian like idiots. <laughs> 
you know, that's the world we're living in. Like maintaining the legacy of those pricks and rubbing their bloated feet while they're bloody, you know, graze their liver spotted hands all over our youth. You know, my, my, I'm sorry. My daughter just graduated uh, recently oh. and half of her graduating class are cam girls now because that's the only job they can get. So I'm a bit pissed off about this right now. Um, I, I'm encouraging her to remain unemployed and to remember um, all the things I showed her about the roadkill when she was a little girl and how to uh, find the good stuff. <laughs> and please don't be a cam girl, my daughter. Anyway. Um, as, as a side to that, you do talk yeah. in your book about, you know, that term of race and then you meet the Samis and you're thinking and they're, they're proper black, but they're white. Yeah, and then yeah. In these terms of indigenous, non-indigenous, first, second peoples. Um, and I love the idea of the colonised brain and it sort of being, I don't know, somewhat infantile. But, but how would you describe those that are wishing to sort of burn everything for the sake of their own prominence as opposed yeah. to people that are trying well, to... Well, it's just, them? as I was starting to say, I, I don't blame them because they, they have no... Nobody is allowed to march or protest to change actual condition now. Remember that back in the day, I think the 70s was the last time anyone did that. Um, try any kind of activism to change condition. Virtue. All we're allowed, the, we've been offered the sphere of um, perception and culture. These are the things that we're allowed to fight for is for the branding of different identities and the positioning of different identities within the culture, because the powerful who own all the capital don't really care about that. We don't have access to any of that capital or any hope for access to any of that capital. All we can do is fight over the fragments of cultural capital that remain to us that may send a few crumbs our way to help us survive. So I don't blame anyone who's doing that stuff. I I'm like, um, you know, I, I don't like it and I'm not prepared to do it alongside you, but, um, but I get it. I, I can see what you're doing there, bros, and best of luck to you. You get stuck in there. I, I can understand. You got to do what you have to do to feed your family. Um, and that's what any of us are doing. So you, so you don't think we could own the biscuit factory rather than fighting over crumbs or the system just isn't oh. built that way? Well, I mean, I wouldn't want to own a biscuit factory that's bloody poisoning a lake mm. for a start. You know, my woman made biscuits like yesterday. And I don't know, they tasted like shit, but they taste, tasted a hell of a lot better than, you know, those maltodextrin whatever ones that you get from the shop. And, you know, and they had the added bonus of, you know, um, not killing the last water rat in the river. So, yeah. No, no, it's good. And in the book, I mean, I, I do some good biscuits as well, and even my bottle seed scones and oh, scones good, eh? tarts for the grannies at Christmas, but it's not really Christmas season. Um, you, do, you do talk about that seasonal effect and, you know, these food chains a bit mm. in your book. And, mm. and, you know, probably up your way, it would be more like the bunya pine and, you know, and that's in season and it's, you know, time for expanding. Mm. That's quite a bit uh, south of me, but I have lived there and, and I do love that. I noticed there's a couple of gubby gubby in the, um, gubby gubby and waka waka in the, in the, um, in the groups here. I saw that pop up in the chat, which is really cool. Hey, how you going there? Bungees. Um, yeah, that, uh, I've been privileged enough to be able to be involved with that, um, Bunya song cycle and to have sat with that. Um, and I tell you, that's, oh, it's the most generative, adaptive, um, beautiful, algorithmic artifact of, of complexity that I've, I've, I think I've ever come across is the Banya song line. I, I don't think anything from our culture has ever moved me as much as, uh, as, much as that song cycle. Um, do you think it's coincidental that you'll find groves of these through England and, you know, you'll go through yeah. groves of them to get to your merry old mansion? Well, that's the pattern. That's the pattern of the song cycle there because it's about trade and it's about bringing everybody together, you know, 
and you can follow out like this big like sea urchin legs almost all the and you can see those lines of travel just like those ones that your people have along that waterway that underground water and then where people saw that and did the telegraph pole as well it's these lines of communication and they continue and you know that uh that bunya way that's a generative pattern you know and um what it is what i learned from a bunya song cycle is is something that i keep putting out there now all the time and it's um and it's a solution to the problem of growth based economies you know because in our way we don't have growth based economies um what we have instead of a growth paradigm is an increase paradigm and i learned that from that increase ceremony from that bunya song cycle that's where i found that that language there and that understanding of, ah, this paradigm of increase is the other side of that coin to growth because growth is about growing the size of the system. Whereas increase is about growing the connections, combinations and relationships within the system. And you can do that infinitely, infinitely into the micro. But if you start trying to grow out into the macro, then you run into that little problem of physics, and you get a burnt to the bloody crisp planet. So uh, we need to understand about increase. This is what I mean about bringing everybody back under the law of the land. If we can't do that, we're all dead. The only problem with that is that um, in order to do that, we would have to let go of our, ah, the one compensation that we've had out of indigeneity is just this idea that we are special and that we have a special connection to the land that nobody else has. And um, I don't think any of us is too keen to give up that, that one thing that we have because <laughs> we can comfort ourselves with the idea that we're special. But if we bring everybody home, then that means we're not special anymore because everybody would be special then. So, um, that's something we'd have to resolve in our own selves. Mm. Yeah. But that's not up to me, that one. That's up to um, yeah, a lot higher status people than me to sort out. No, it's interesting. There's a place of increase not far from here. Um, um, and anyway, I was wanting to talk to you about sort of quantum thinking. Um, probably a bit off track, but... No, same I, one. I, I love the idea that within the book, you can look at these things differently. And it's almost as though the people out there are taking a conscious effort to try and teach something along the lines of quantum thinking where you don't have to think sort of binary. It's, mm. You can see things differently. Yeah. Well, that's, that's what quantum computing is. And that's what allows an idiot like me to put together thoughts that, um, are really interesting and complex, you know, like, like I say, I don't know very much. Um, but it's what I do with that in allowing other people's stories to come in and not like trying to make my narrative beat everybody else's, you know, if I sit down with everybody else's and I do combinatorials, then I, you get complexity and interesting things. Now, this is what quantum computing is. All right. So this crappy machine that we're both using now, this is outdated. I mean, they could do this back in the goddamn early 80s, what we're operating on now. It's the same bloody thing. And there's been absolutely no technological advancement at all, except they made the screens look sexier. That's about it. You know, but basically, you know, they're shooting electrons with little bits of light and telling that electron, hey, you're a zero. <laughs> and then they're telling this other electron over here, hey, you're a one. And they're making uh, bits like that. Of, of data and that's what's allowing us to talk to each other right now but i mean it's so weird because in quantum physics they know that an electron can be in two different places at once and can be two different things at once and can be entangled with other electrons an electron in your left buttock can jump up to the pleiades constellation and probably is right now while we're talking and just go hey fellas how you doing and then pop back to your right butt cheek you know, they flip around everywhere across the universe and instantaneously. So in quantum computing, they just change the frequency a bit and they tell an electron, hey, you're a zero. Um, but 
hey, at the same time, you're a one, bros. <laughs> and so in that, they don't create, they create more than a bit. They create a qubit. And uh, so quantum computing, you know, basically, you know, makes these supercomputers that are running on qubits rather than bits. And it's basically, I mean, it's a really long and clunky, stupid way to get around to what we do with our minds anyway. When we're sitting around the fire and having a yarn, we're making more than just qubits. We're making multi-dimensional, 13-dimensional recursive bits that are, um, oh, man, they keep looking for this unified field theory in physics, and they've gone the wrong way with that string theory. It's rubbish. You know, and they hit a dead end with it, but they've got to wait for all the old guys who invented it to die first before they can go off in the other direction. I say just quit. Quit, come sit around a fire with us, and uh, you, you'll find those poly bits that you're looking for. And you'll find that you don't need a machine to run the bastard. You just need to talk to people and listen. Find out about what deep listening really is. Come back under the law. Be human again. We already got all this superpowers that you're trying to tinker out of bloody bits of little bits of blood soaked Africa that's been ripped out of the ground and bloody shoved into your device, but first processed in the most toxic way on the planet that produces radioactive waste that we've got to store for bloody thousands of years somehow. Um, otherwise, it'll leak out and kill us all. Well, same for solar panels. They do this. Oh, yeah, that solar panels is renewable. Oh, that's sustain. It's not sustainable. Jesus, just talk to each other, please. We already have all these superpowers. We know how to use them. Let's just sit around a fire and yarn for a bit. Please, Jesus. Anyway, that's where I'm up to. No, that's good. We're going to get that fire cranking outside in a little <laughs> while. And, uh, and I think, too, that, that idea of just sitting around a fire. It's, yeah. It's, it's funny though, because some of my uncles, they'll all get together, but they'll all stand sort of back to back and have this sort of perfect conversation. And it's yeah. just it's odd to watch. Yeah. Well, that's where you start to see how gammon a lot of these yarning circles are. And they're really coming out of a tradition of uh, group therapy from the United States. You know what I mean? Coming out of all this Jungian stuff. Basically, all they've done is they've taken a line and turned it into a circle. And, you know, everybody's got to go around and everyone's got to sit politely while each person monologues through their tragic life story while they're holding a talking stick. And they go, oh, we're having a yarning circle. No, you're not. You're not yarning. You're just taking turns to monologue. Shut up. And why do they always go clockwise around these bloody circles? It's like, no, at least follow the direction of the sun if you're going to take turns like idiots. And, you know, a circle, it's not like it doesn't have to be a perfect circle. You know, usually you've got all different parts and some people got their back turned, like you said, bros. And there's dogs coming in and running around fighting over that chop there. And there's kids running in and out and there's bloody all kinds of stuff going on. You know, if you're making this closed system of a circle, then all you're going to get is entropy. That's the first law of thermodynamics that these idiots base their model of time on to make it run straight. I propose in my book that we need to use the, oh, sorry, that's the second law of thermodynamics. Jesus. I propose in my book that we need to use the first law of thermodynamics, which is about, you know, interconnected, uh, you know, um, infinite systems that are just cycling energy and matter around and around. Um, that's our reality. And they know that in physics. And um, that's been the model of time that, you know, human beings have used for about a million years. Can we get back to that? Because there's actually no such thing as a vacuum. Time only runs straight in a closed system. Stop trying to make these closed system and please call the universe something else. You know, mm. universe, it's from the Latin vertere to become or turn into and uni one turned into one. You know, they're basically trying to make that re-engineer that singularity of just unifying and uniformizing everything, making a vast galactic monoculture and shrinking it back to one goddamn particle again. Ah, oh, please don't do that. And shut that goddamn Hadron Collider down. You've gone the wrong way with super string theory anyway. String theory and all that sort of thing. Just chill out for a minute. Talk around a fire. The physics is there. You haven't even figured out the physics of fire yet. You don't even know what it is. Just spend another thousand years looking at that fire and figuring that out. Take your time, bros. Anyway, I just monologued again. 
No, the mucker, the mucker, we call it. Um, yeah, it's, yeah, no, powerful stuff. Mucker. Uh, mucker. That means something yeah. different for me. That yeah. means like enough. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're conscious of how much of your time we're taking up, Tyson. So just to end things, um, can you tell us what's next for you? Is there a Sand Talk 2 on the way? Or I did hear rumours of a Viking no Viking novel. Yeah, man. Um, I, I did write the first couple of chapters of the Viking novel, but I think I, I just, I found, they were just humouring me. Nobody wants to read my Viking novel. It sucks because <laughs> that's all I want to do. Um, and that was, you know, if I was just out in the world for myself and doing what made me feel good. That's what I'd be doing. I'd be writing Viking novels, but, but nobody wants to read that. Um, you know, so <laughs> anyway, kind of, I'm supposed to have, is it October already? It is yeah. yeah. I'm past my deadline for um, me and uh, old man Juma was supposed to co-author like a, um, a compressed version of sand talk. That was 50% image and him doing all the images and me doing the words. And that was more of a narrative that was accessible to people, you know, 12 years old and above. So that middle year schooling, but basically just everybody, you know, more accessible, less dense, you know, less narcissistic and, you know, <laughs> so uh, yeah, we were supposed to have done that already. And we haven't bloody done it yet. And it's mostly because I can't carve anything here on lockdown. I can't go and get wood. If anybody wants to drop a bunch of red gum root, or something out the front of my place, please give me a call. I need something to carve with. Oh, um, right. Yeah, uh, but also, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of looking at another one when I'm interested in this idea of cybernetics. And until I got that warning yesterday from that uh, thinker in the US, I was really wanted to start looking into consciousness and, and uh, explore that from an indigenous point of view. I was even interested in trying to, and I still am in setting up some kind of institute um, where you can have a lot of the top indigenous thinkers, you know, in Australia and around the world, uh, starting to grapple with, um, with the question of consciousness and finally just putting that to rest so people can stop bloody asking that question. Um, you know, consci ooh, ooh. consciousness and, and, and just sort of go, yeah, of course there's magic here. And like, I want to do some sci research and go, look there, yes. ESP is a thing. We can, you can freaking talk across. That's where everything is. It's in those lines and relations in between things. It's called warm data. Nora Bates and does it all the time. And you've done the workshop, you know, it's there. All right, let's move on. So I kind of want to do that stuff next. Um, yeah. And I kind of want to co-author that with my, with my woman who is like this genius who's looking at second wave automation and blockchain technology uh, for, through an indigenous knowledge lens um, of complexity. So, you know, it's like, I tell you, we're like Ike and Tina Turner, not the uh, domestic abuse side of things, but Ike and Tina Turner in terms of, you know, Ike was the famous one who kind of brought, she was kind of like, it's, you know, like Ike and Tina. And now it's like, here's Tina. Who the fuck is Ike? That's, uh, <laughs> 50 so years she's ago. coming next. Keep your eyes open for um, Megan Kelleher. She's, uh, yeah, she's a better thinker than me. And she Why takes the time. We'll have to have her on our next it. series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But before we go, um, just quickly, uh, me. I do love some yarns, um, particularly some of the old fairy tales and um, having a bit of an ecologist background, you know, I reflect a little on um, Alice in Wonderland and the Red Queen theory about this Red Queen wanting as fast as she can just to stay in one spot. Mm. Um, you mentioned noon, is it noonday demons in the book? Do, do you have many other sort of fairy tales or sort of cool Man, things? Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, everything. Like I, I, you look for, all right. So the most important thing about indigenous methodology around knowledge, what we've always done is when new, new knowledge comes in, we look for the foundational story of that knowledge. And if it's right story, then we'll start looking at ways to bring it in because we're adaptive like that, but we do it carefully. So yeah, I always look at the foundational narratives. And there's great, you know, if, if I have to interact with um, European culture and I have to live in ways of the Anglosphere, then I want to know their foundational narratives. And they've got some goodies too. <laughs> but that, I, I, the, that's basically the noonday demon 
is the mythology behind the Protestant work ethic. So I wanted to know why I have to work my ass off for a third of my life and like sell my cheeks to this bloody economy, which I'm just sick of doing. Like, I want to know why. So I, um, I look for the foundational narrative and I find the noonday demon who's going to eat your soul. If you think of having a nap. Ah, sweet. Okay, cool. Hey, thanks. Uh, chat people. Yeah. So that noonday demon is the one. He's the one who's going to eat your soul. Ah. Anyway, uh, I have no idea what you are up to. I think you're closing. But yeah, um, I guess we'll just leave you with the warning. Don't take a nap. Don't have a siesta because that noonday demon will eat your soul. <laughs> All right.